Okay, well, thank you folks for coming. Um, and like I said, thanks for being on time. I'm Carolyn Merrick, Program Coordinator here at the Center. And it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you Sarah, excuse me, <clears throat> Sarah Cooperman from the Rockfish Wildlife Sanctuary. Um, our talk is Rockfish Wildlife Sanctuary Supporting Native Species. And uh, you're in for a real treat, I think. Also, I want to read you the description um, that's on the website about Sarah. So, oh, um, yes, <laughs> as an, as, as, by way of introduction. Sarah Cooperman, a Category 4 wildlife rehabilitator, has loved animals her whole life and would try to coax deer in her house as a child when her parents weren't looking. <laughs> After graduating Williams College in 2017 with a degree in biology and environmental studies, Sarah spent last year studying perceptions of bats in other countries thanks to a travel fellowship. In Australia, she was inspired by the wildlife rehabilitators she met who used rescued flying foxes as education ambassadors. And she's excited to now start her own journey as a wildlife rehabilitator here at um, the Rockfish Wildlife Sanctuary. While bats still hold a special place in Sarah's heart, she's enthusiastic about getting to know a wide variety of local Virginian wildlife in such a lovely natural setting. So Sarah, thanks so much for coming and take it away. Ooh, all right, well, I am going to take it away with a few slides <laughs> um, just to introduce Rockfish to all of you and tell you a little bit more about what we do as rehabilitators, because a lot of folks hear wildlife rehabilitation and don't quite understand all the trappings involved with that process. So hopefully I can use some slides to introduce that to you and then we can meet some of our other friends that will be joining our call today. So let me share my screen. And pop that guy open. All right, so who we are at Rockfish Wildlife Sanctuary. Oh, I am now, ah, there we go. <laughs> so I wanna start by introducing our mission, which is three-pronged. So the first part of our mission is to rescue and rehabilitate injured and orphaned native wildlife in central Virginia. And ultimately our goal is always to release those animals. In wildlife rehab, we are always, always, always aiming for that third R um, of the three Rs, that release. The second part of our job here is informing fellow citizens of what to do when they find a wild animal. So we are trained from an early age as humans to know who to call when there's a crime or a fire or someone needs medical attention. But what the heck are you supposed to do when you encounter a tiny little pink baby squirrel on the sidewalk in front of you or a red-tailed hawk that's been hit by a car? So we aim to be that kind of first resource for folks in the public to figure out what to do and how to help that animal that they've encountered. And the third aspect of our mission at Rockfish is to educate the people of Central Virginia and beyond about the habitats and needs of wildlife and how we can continue, continue to coexist and be good neighbors to our wild neighbors. So the first part of that mission is, as I said, the three R's, rescue, rehab, and release. So some basic stats. This year so far, we've had 759 wild animal patients. That's actually a slight dip compared to our previous years. We're thinking because of COVID, so many people have been staying at home that they're just not out and about um, encountering as many animals in need. But um, typically we have around 800 patients every year. We treat typically around 60 species every year, over 60 species. And our release rate is right around 60%. And that's a number that we're really proud of at Rockfish. The national average tends to be around 40%. Um, so we're really, really proud of the work that we do here. And we pride ourselves on treating every single animal life as a life that has value and a life that's worth Worth treatment and care. So the second part of our, oh, actually, well, um, the way that we're able to do that mission to rescue, rehab, and release has to do a lot with where we are in Virginia and the gorgeous plot of land that we are lucky to be able to operate from. So we are on 20 plus acres of land down in Nelson County. So it is a little bit of a hike uh, from Charlottesville. I get a lot of good podcast listening time on my commute, but it's perfect to be out in the middle of the woods because it's an ideal environment for our patients. They are in a low stress environment and that helps them heal and get better so they can get back out into the wild. We have a 3000 square foot building that is entirely built 
built for wildlife rehabilitation in the first place. We have two indoor nurseries. I am actually coming to you live from <laughs> one of those nurseries right now that we have converted into a reptile room for the winter. So you can see I'm next to a bunch of turtles <laughs> right now. And there are two space heaters keeping it at around 85 degrees. So it's a little toasty in here, but perfect for our turtle friends. Um, and outside we have 50 outdoor enclosures and we can house virtually any native species here in Virginia. The only animals we don't currently treat are bears, deer and eagle, but any other kind of animal you encounter, we are there to help you and guide you to the correct resource. Even if you do encounter a bear, deer, or eagle will give you the proper advice to get that animal into care. So let's talk about the next part of our uh, mission here, which is to teach people, to inform our fellow citizens of what to do when you find that little baby squirrel on the sidewalk. So in our busy season, which typically starts around March and goes through October, um, we call, we get about 20 phone calls per day of all kinds of crazy situations. Actually, just yesterday, someone called about finding a box of 45 pet rats in the middle of a <laughs> um, baseball field. So at that, while we can't take those animals into our care because they're a domestic species, we're able to serve as that first resource and direct them to the proper resource for that situation, which would be the SPCA. So we get tons and tons of calls and we are there to help people find um, the right way to help that animal, whether that's coming to us, going over to the Wildlife Center of Virginia, where that animal can receive veterinary care, or another resource like the SPCA. And then our third part of our program is education and outreach, which I'm so excited to be doing with y'all today. But we have a great squad of education ambassador animals that for whatever reason are not able to be released back out into the wild. So because of that, they live with us in the lap of luxury <laughs> here at Rockfish and they serve as ambassadors for their species and meet people of all ages in the public. So um, our animals typically reach over 3000 people per year. So it's really exciting to watch a child see a vulture for the first time. <laughs> and when you tell that child, oh, you know, vultures pee on their legs to cool off and clean themselves and the kids jaws just drop. It's really special to be able to connect with the public over our love of wildlife <laughs> and jaws drop with adults too when you tell them that fact. <laughs> so I wanted to show you some photos from our baby season this past year because a lot of the job is um, feeding Eating and cleaning and taking care of really adorable special animals. So um, here is a tiny baby squirrel on the left. Its eyes are entirely sealed. Its ears are shut to its head. Typically squirrels are our first animals to come in and mark the start of our baby season. And we do something called the squirrel pool <laughs> in January where we all take bets on what day the first squirrel will come into the sanctuary. Um, I won the bet two years ago, just saying. <laughs> it was February 22nd, but typically that last couple of weeks of February is when we'll start our busy season. Um, this year, we had that little duck on the right as our second patient, which was quite unusual. The waterfowl tend to come in later. We get a lot of possums, typically between 100 to 200 opossums. And opossums can come in in litter sizes up to 13 animals at once. So <laughs> in one day, you may gain a whole bunch of new patients just from one litter of possums. And they grow up to be extra cute, as you can see on that guy on the right. <laughs> This year we had a special situation. So we do have enclosures to take care of birds of prey here. Um, and this summer we were surprised when a woman called in saying, yeah, I just woke up to a bunch of vultures sitting in my fireplace. And so we had her send us some photos and lo and behold, it was actually a clutch of barn owlets. They look certainly like vultures. They're very strange looking little alien birds, but um, these birds came into our care and we rehabilitated them for the next two months until they looked like this. 
Um, so these were photos of the barn owls on the day of their release. That's why they're in a, a small crate. We were taking them out to the farm that they were going to be released at. And um, as far as we know, they are out there in the world being just absolutely gorgeous and breathtaking. So it was really special to be able to work with such amazing creatures. Something funny that we do when we rehabilitate raptors is cover our entire faces. So this year we would wear a mask on our nose and mouth and then we'd put another mask on top of our head. So we looked sort of like blue alien smurf people. We could hardly see anything, but that makes it so the bird is not imprinting on humans. The bird is not getting comfortable with people and um, the bird is then able to be released knowing that it's a barn owl. <laughs> so just an example of kind of those extra steps we take to make sure that the animals thrive once they are released. Something special about our facility is we are one of the only facilities in Virginia that accepts large swaths of rabies vector species. So it doesn't mean that they're rabid. It just means that the species has a statistically higher chance of carrying the rabies virus. So um, we do take red fox kits like this sweet little thing. This was our very first patient of 2020 this year, which was a total surprise. As I said, squirrels are typically our, our first baby. But in came this little 100 gram tiny chocolatey poof of fur that grew up to be a gorgeous red fox kit. And we are also one of the only facilities in Virginia that accepts raccoons at all. So this year, I think we're up to 96 raccoons in our intakes. So we treat a lot of raccoons around here. <laughs> they are very cute. And then that little guy on the left is a baby skunk, which we treat as well. Um, pro tip, they don't spray us all the time. What we do is tuck their tail under their tushy and then they can't spray us. So that's how we stay spray free at Rockfish. Um, so I just wanted to give you a glimpse of what we do and what kind of animals we treat before I introduce you to some of those animals. But a quick note, we're currently doing a, an online auction art fundraiser right now. Um, and the link for that is on our website, which is listed right on that slide, just our name.org. And it's also posted on Facebook. So if you want, you can go and check out the pieces that we are um, fundraising. And there's also just a plain fundraiser you can donate to if you're not feeling in the artistic mood. <laughs> But um, with that being said, I'll leave this slideshow and then introduce you to a few of our critters that are education ambassador animals. So these are the animals that for whatever medical or behavioral reason were not well suited to life out in the wild. So they live with us. Um, it's great with adults because typically I don't need to say, okay, we're now going to channel our inner tree and take a deep breath and remember to be nice and quiet when the creatures come out. But if you would like, you can channel your inner tree right now. <laughs> um, but I am going to start off by hand sanitizing not just because of COVID, of course, but my first guest today is an Eastern box turtle. And whenever handling turtles, we can make them quite sick with the bacteria that we have on our hands as humans. So I always make sure before handling our turtles that I am totally clean. I just washed my hands before hopping on the Zoom call and now I've sanitized for that extra, extra bit. But I'm gonna go grab him. So you'll get to the um, distinct pleasure of looking at our linen wool. <laughs> Hey, bud. So this is one of my co-workers. <laughs> this is a tar and a tar, as I said, is an Eastern box turtle. Um, he's very nice and toasty. He was just sunning himself under his UV light and um, laying on top of his heat pad. So in the winter time, turtles, all reptiles actually do something like hibernation. It's called brumation. And they basically shut down for the winter time. But because we use a tar at educational programs and because the other turtles that were overwintering need to heal from their injuries, um, we don't want them to hibernate. We don't want them to shut down for the winter. So that's why we've turned this room into a big old reptile room. So they're not getting those cold weather cues to go, oh, Oh, time to really slow down. Um, so Atar is a very friendly, curious fellow. And that is because unfortunately he was um, confiscated from an animal hoarding situation. So it's such a bummer um, in that context
text, he became entirely habituated to humans. So you can see he is very curious right now. <laughs> Most turtles, if you encounter them in the wild, go into their shell. The trademark going into their shell, but Atar loves an audience. He is quite a, a people's turtle. <laughs> so when the uh, Department of Game officers were looking through all of these animals from this hoarding situation, they saw this turtle and thought, you know, this guy's not going to make it very long in the wild. So he came to live with us as an education ambassador. The other and more important reason why he was not releasable is because we had no idea where he came from. And that is very important. So whenever bring, someone brings a turtle into care, we always make sure they take really exact notes on where exactly that turtle came from, basically down to GPS coordinates if possible. And that's because a turtle can spend its entire life pretty much in the size of a football field. They don't have big home territories, but everything they do will be inside of that home territory. They know where the best berries are. They know where the best spas are. By spas, I mean puddles. <laughs> um, and then they know where the neighboring turtles start, where their territories start. So we just knew that Atar was being kept as a pet and we had no idea where in the world he would have come from. If we just put him down on the road, he would have spent his entire life, which can go up to 40 plus years in the wild, trying to get back to his home territory. And naturally that can be a death sentence for turtles when they're just released back out into the wild, not in the right spot. So this is important to keep in mind when you're trying to help turtles. So animal lovers, I'm sure we're all on the Zoom call because of that. If you encounter a turtle on the road, the best way to help it is just sanitize your hands, pick it up like a sandwich, and then shuffle it across the road in the direction that it was pointing. Even if he's all the way by this curb over here, if he's pointing that way, you're still going to pick him up like a sandwich and move him all the way across the road. If you just um, scuttle him back to wherever he was closest to, he's going to go right back out into that road. Also, you don't want to say, oh, you know, I have a really nice patch of woods in my backyard. I'm just going to move him there. Again, that's removing him from his home territory and spelling disaster essentially to a turtle. So really good information to keep in mind when looking out for the turtles on the road. It's awesome to help them. Just make sure you're doing it the right way. Um, but a few facts about turtles in the first place. Box turtles, it's a whole um, group of turtles uh, across the United States. And they're called that because they have this special hinge. So a lot of turtles just have a flat um, bottom of their shell, a flat path, clap, clap. <laughs> Pass carapace. Carapace is the top, plastron is the bottom. Ooh, those scientific words, it's the heat in here, I'm telling you. <laughs> so on his tummy side, the plastron of the shell, he has that special hinge that he can manually close. So sort of like closing the door of your bedroom, Atar is able to do the same thing and totally seal in around the shell. And that's pretty unique among turtles. All turtles can go inside their shell, but box turtles can take it that step further and totally seal up the shell. So they are not aquatic. <laughs> Another important thing to keep in mind, if you see a turtle, don't just go throw it in the river near you thinking that that's a better habitat. This guy cannot swim. He is heavy and bulbous, no offense, bud, but um, he is not built to swim. He's not like a slider. So just make sure you're scooting them off the road wherever is safest right near where they were going. Um, let me think of other things that I can share about you. Oh, a very important fact about him is that right there is Atar's spine. So the shell is very much an integrated part of their skeletal system. It is their skeleton. And he has ribs going out in all directions on his backside. So if you do encounter a turtle with a cracked shell, some people believe this myth that turtles can't feel their shells. But it would be like if you broke your back. So not pleasant. <laughs> you know, I always have children touch their spines and say that's exactly what a tar can feel when I'm touching his shell. So good to keep in mind that if you do see a turtle with a cracked shell or even an abrasion on their shell, like a deep wound on their shell, always give us a ring at Rockfish and we'll make sure that that turtle gets some medical care. But again, write down exactly where you picked it up. Um, so who has questions about Atar? I'd be happy to take some questions before moving on to our next guest. <laughs> He's trying to swim away from me. Maybe Carolyn. Um, yeah, and uh, 
people are able to unmute themselves. So mm -hmm. go ahead and do that. And Lucy, I think. Yes, um, I recently read an article about a turtle that um, had children apparently had painted the shell mm. in the craft project and the article was pointing out that that was damaging. Is that correct? That is correct. So painting a turtle shell is a big, big no-no. And in fact, if you do see a turtle with the painted shell, that's a case in which you should call us or call the wildlife center because that should be removed by a veterinarian. So there's two reasons why that's not great. The first is that the paint might be toxic. Um, reptiles tend to have pretty sensitive skin and shells. So if you introduce um, something toxic into that environment, it can make them sick. The more important reason is that if you paint a turtle shell bright purple, Atar is using camouflage. And in fact, that's one of the main defense mechanisms for a lot of reptiles and small woodland creatures, the fact that they blend in so seamlessly with their environment. That bright purple is going to stick out like a sore thumb and any hungry predator will see him in an instant and have a nice lunch. So very two very important reasons why you should not paint a turtle shell. And if you do encounter that, definitely give us a ring and we'll make sure to remove it safely. Great question. How many different types of turtles are there in the area? And is the box turtle the primary uh, turtle in terms of population? Um, I don't know the exact number for you on the number of reptile or turtles in the area. So I will have to find that out and I can get back to you. But box turtles are going to be the most common ones in the area. Typically, if you're walking around the woods, if you see a turtle, you're going to be seeing a box turtle. It is important to note that their numbers are declining, though, in recent years. So um, another reason, you know, don't take it as a pet. Don't move it away from wherever you found it. Um, really, we need to protect these guys. But yeah, their numbers are declining due to habitat loss mostly and the fact that so many people will kidnap them and take them as pets um, just like Atar was. Um, what is their lifespan in years? Mm -hmm. So uh, for a boxer like this they can live over 40 years typically in captivity um, it's going to be over 40. In the wild you're more looking at like 20 plus years um, but a lot of turtles, a really cool thing about reptiles is that when they hatch from their eggs or occasionally there's live birth, there is absolutely no parental care. So if you encounter a turtle in the wild that's the size of a quarter or a nickel, that turtle doesn't need help. That turtle's not an orphan. They are hatched knowing totally what to do, how to be a wild animal and, and how to go from there. There's zero parental care involved. So. Um, a lot of turtles, <laughs> for that reason, they have big clutches because many of them are eaten early on. So that lifespan um, is definitely just for the turtles that make it to a larger size. <laughs> what do they eat? Yeah, so atar in the wild, they're pretty opportunistic and they are omnivores. So they can eat vegetable food um, and meat. Um, and that can be a surprising fact for people that turtles can eat meat products. They love eating little insects, but Atar's absolute favorite meal are mouse guts. So <laughs> if I'm chopping up mice or rats for our raptor, <laughs> raptor patients here. Occasionally I will feel extra decadent and drop a few onto a tar's dish for the day and he will scuttle right over as fast as a turtle can go <laughs> and enjoy them. So it is a surprising fact but in the wild they are especially drawn to red. That's been scientifically shown that red is a, a compelling color for them for whatever reason. So they love to eat raspberries. We typically will make a dish of lettuce, um, some type of red berry or red red fruit, um, a little bit of hard boiled egg, some mealworms, and then like I said, an occasional mouse gut here or there. <laughs> Yum. All right, so I am gonna put him away and then move on to our next guest hey, today. Just, I think one person, oh, Barbara, yeah, yeah. did you have a question? Yeah, uh, a box turtle and a snapping turtle, two different turtles. Yes. So snapping turtles and box turtles are different. That's a great question. So snapping turtles tend to be 
real big. If you see them when they're small, it's it's hard to describe, but I honestly just typically tell people they look like little dinosaurs. They have much more ridged shells. They tend to be a more uniformly dark, muddy color, and that's because they are more aquatic turtles. So they're not trying to camouflage into the forest floor where there's leaf litter and sticks and twigs that make um, a variety of colors that would end up on this guy's shell. They are just kind of mud color <laughs> for the muddy waters that they have hang out in. They also have a much longer, thicker tail. Um, and if you think that you might have encountered a snapping turtle on the road, don't be afraid to help it. What you should do is if you have anything long in your truck, like um, your, your car, <laughs> I tend to have a window ice scraper in my car at all times. You never know. It just hangs out in the trunk. What you can do is hop out into the road if it's safe to do so. Pop that right in front of the turtle's mouth and often they will latch onto it, giving you the opportunity to shuffle them across the road. Snapping turtles have telescopic necks. So if I held a snapping turtle like this, he could really easily just go right under and squish me, <laughs> which would not be very fun, especially if you're just trying to help that animal. So always make sure that that mouth is occupied before moving them across the road. Um, all right, I am going to pop him back into his enclosure and then I will take out my next guest. <laughs> back to the linen view. All right, thanks, Atar. So my next co-worker, <laughs> I am going to um, sanitize my hands again because you should not only sanitize right before you handle a turtle, but after you handle a turtle as well. And that's so that turtle doesn't make you sick. Um, you know, people used to talk all the time about how they can carry salmonella and whatnot, which is true. Um, so always just make sure you're extra, extra. The turtle Sorry. Every year in my yard, turtles uh, will lay their eggs in the yard yeah. and then bury them and then go on. Yeah. Come back to that same place. It seems like they're in the same area that then the next year they come and lay their eggs. Would that be the same turtle or maybe the eggs of, you know, to go back? It would likely be the same turtle. So like I mentioned, they're pretty territorial. Once they find a nesting site that works for them and they feel is safe for their clutch of eggs, typically they will return to it. Um, sea turtles will do the same thing. That's why there are certain beaches that every year they knock off, um, they totally rope off because they know those turtles are coming right back to where they did the year before. Um, all right, I am gonna go grab my snake. <laughs> Not a sentence you hear every day, I guess. <laughs> All right. Barbara, how lucky you are. I hope you think it's lucky that you get this clutch of turtles every year. Wow, that's exciting. All right. So this beautiful lady, um, one of my favorite co-workers, <laughs> don't tell the humans I said that, um, this is Autumn and she is a corn snake and uh, I just think she's so gorgeous. Um, she's about three and a half feet long, but she is a constrictor. So typically in the snake world, I like to think of it as um, venomous snakes that will use their venom to stun prey and then they'll eat it, um, or constrictors. So these are snakes like corn snakes that will wrap around their prey to stun the prey or kill the prey before they they eat it. <laughs> um, but she likes to coil up. She'll often just wrap around my arm. It's like a real snake bracelet <laughs> while I'm hanging out with her. But rest assured, she's about three and a half feet long. And right off the bat, we can tell that she also uses a lot of camouflage. So on her backside, she has a lot of the same coloring that Atar did. So those browns and oranges, really beautiful pattern. And then on her tummy, however, she has a different pattern. So it's a much creamy creamier pattern and it's much whiter. And this is kind of like advanced Olympic level camouflage essentially. And it's called counter shading. So it's when an animal has one pattern on one side of them and then a different on the other. And that's because snakes can live on the ground. Oh, she slapped me with her tail. <laughs> on the ground, under the ground or up in trees. And you know, we don't like to think about all the snakes hanging out in trees above us. <laughs> when we go for a hike, but they are up there because they make great little basking zones for snakes. 
Um, but that allows them, this coloring allows them to hide from predators, no matter what angle that predator might be looking from. So if Autumn is on the ground, slithering along, it's going to be hard for a predator to look down and tell her apart from the rest of the darker leaf litter on the forest floor. However, if she's up in a tree, a predator is going to be looking up, scanning what tasty snacks might be up there, and they're going to have a hard time telling that white tummy from the bright white light from the sun, especially because a lot of predators um, don't have as great vision as we do, as we're used to. A lot of animals in the wild rely on different senses to navigate, so that white belly is going to blend in really nicely with the bright light above them, so it's going to be difficult for them them to see. And you're going to notice counter shading in a lot of arboreal species. So a lot of bird species have counter shading. They'll have those whiter tummies and then darker backsides. Squirrels as well, they've got a white tummy and then dark brownish gray backside. So cool to go and be able to take a look out in the woods the next time you're there and um, look at all the animals and how, how cool and pro their camouflage is <laughs> up in the trees above you. Um, and so Autumn is using her tongue right now to sniff us. I think she's confused because normally when I'm holding her and talking loudly above her, she knows there's a bunch of people <laughs> in front of her because she can smell them. I'm not sure that she's quite adjusted to virtual programming yet, but <laughs> she's trying her hardest to sniff you and say hello. But they have, and most snakes have this, a special gland on the roof of their mouth that takes in scent particles from their environment and essentially translate it, translates it into taste. So humans, our sense of smell and taste are connected, but not to the same extent that a snake's is. They will take that scent in and they will literally taste their environment. And that's a reason why their tongue is forked. So when they stick their tongue out, they're able to take in a wider range of scents around them and better understand their environment. So that is why snakes have a forked tongue, not because they're evil, but because they are just navigating their world the way that they know how. Um, so snakes do swallow their prey whole, <laughs> which is not super glamorous, but it does get the job done. So Scarlet Pearl, oh, not Scarlet Pearl, I'm getting excited. <laughs> Um, that's our next guess. Um, Autumn can unhinge her jaw to be able to do that. So she can swallow a meal that's about three times the size of her head. <laughs> so it's pretty crazy, but that is just how they get the job done. And they really don't need to eat that much. And this is true for um, Atar turtles as well. All reptiles are cold-blooded. And embarrassingly, I didn't really know what cold-blooded meant until basically a couple years ago. I heard it growing up and I always was just too embarrassed to ask, what does that actually mean? <laughs> so what it basically means is that you rely on your environment to control your body temperature. So humans and mammals, we are warm blooded. Our bodies are working so, so hard all around the clock, even when we're asleep to maintain 98.6 degree body temperature. And doing that requires a lot of calories, um, and it also takes a lot of energy. So when we are cold, our bodies will naturally just start to shiver. That's our body's way of using energy to warm up. And then when we are really hot, we'll start to sweat. Um, and that is the same way our body using energy and calories that we've eaten, she's sniffing me, <laughs> to cool back off. So we need to be constantly eating. I mean, I'm hungry the second I wake up, I need a morning snack and lunch, we are eating all throughout the day. Autumn, on the other hand, when she is hot, she will just go find a nice cool pool to lay in. And when she's cold, she'll go lie on top of her heat pad or in the wild. She'll go bask under the sun to warm up and that will manually bring her body temperature up. She doesn't need to be constantly burning calories to maintain that homeostasis, that um, neutral level within her body. So because of that, she eats one meal per month. <laughs> I don't know about you, but if I ate breakfast on December 1st and would have not eaten since I would be a monster <laughs> by now. I would have been a monster by noon on December 1st. So um, that is a cool way that reptiles have adapted to scarcity. Um, they are able to just slow their bodies down when resources are not super available. And then once they get those calories, they won't need calories for a while longer. They are okay to just chill out <laughs> under the sun or under the ground and um, keep their um, energy expenditures low. 
So that is the difference between cold and warm blooded and it makes caring for reptiles like Autumn quite easy. However, Autumn did come into us because she was someone's pet. So corn snakes are a native species here in Virginia. They do live out in the woods, but they typically are a pretty popular snake within the pet trade, especially for reptile keepers. So one of our volunteers actually, Pete, saw Autumn being sold on Craigslist. <laughs> and it was clear from the photos that she wasn't getting the best care possible. So Pete uh, snatched her up and brought her into rock fish and said this is your new education animal and autumn has been with us ever since because of that we don't quite know how old she is um, we think she's a bit older because she sheds her skin um, a little bit more frequently these days than she used to when she was younger and that's a good way to tell with snakes um, they do shed their skin entirely basically like taking a t-shirt off <laughs> inside out over their heads including their eyelids every few months and she does it about every three months um, but we think she's likely around 10 years old and in captivity they can live to be up to 15 or so so she's in great health otherwise in the wild they're more likely to live um, between like six to ten years if they're lucky it's rough out there <laughs> um, they make great prey for birds of prey surprisingly a lot of hawks raptors and owls will love munching on a snake and possums as well are happy to munch on baby snakes so they've definitely got their work cut out for them in terms of surviving um, are there any questions about autumn that i can take you can just unmute yourself or uh yeah. Let me see, or... Um, does the snake uh, strike at all? I mean, does it have teeth that it would latch on to a prey before it constricts it? Yes, um, so Autumn has never struck me, and that's probably just because she was bred as a pet. Um, a lot of those behaviors are dulled in a lot of pets that are bred in the pet trade, but we have another education snake named Teeny, who is not so teeny. He's about seven feet long, <laughs> um, and he's a black rat snake, and he is not so socialized, so he's definitely struck us a couple of times, and um, if that happens, sometimes they can leave some teeth. <laughs> They're very, very, very tiny little teeth, but again, that's okay because those aren't teeth for chewing. They swallow their prey holes so they just have to be tiny almost like serrations on the edge of a knife just sharp enough to hold on to whatever they want to um, eat as they figure out the best way to get their jaw around it so yep they do have tiny tiny little teeth and um, they do strike but they will not um, non-venomous snakes will obviously not have the venom when they strike and they don't have the fangs either yeah, and we only have a few species of venomous snake here in Virginia. Um, and I do really want to impress upon you that they're not evil, they're not trying to hurt you. It's definitely good to be cautious if you encounter a cottonmouth or a rattlesnake. But um, the only time a snake will ever use its venom is if it feels its life is in danger. So if you see that snake, you acknowledge that it's there, you take a few steps back and do whatever you were doing, that snake is going to just go on its merry way and will have nothing to do with you. Snakes only have a certain amount of venom that they can use at once and they do not want to waste that venom on a human that is way too big for it to eat. So just keep that in mind if you encounter a venomous snake that they really, really just want to be left alone and you're only increasing the risk of a bite if you try to interact with it. All right, any more questions about Autumn? I just had one question. Um, Sarah, you said uh, it was clear that Autumn wasn't getting the best care possible. How did you know that? Yeah, um, so in the photos, I didn't see the photos, but I think the substrate, so um, like the stuff that she was sitting on, gotcha. we her in nice, fresh, um, like pine mulchy bark stuff. And I think it was just flat. There was no texture on it. Um, they also need a pretty specific heat setup with a UV light. So they get faux sunlight essentially during the day and a heat pad underneath. And I don't think that those heat sources were there. Gotcha. Yeah, great question. Um, snakes are definitely, I mentioned they're easy to care for just in terms of food. You know, they're not going to eat you out of house and home, but you do really need to be a reptile lover and be willing to spend the money on a perfect setup to make sure that they're comfortable and have all of those basic needs met. Yeah. Great. Awesome. All right. Any more um, questions about Autumn? Yeah, anybody else? You can just unmute yourselves. 
<laughs> she's gotten very squirmy because she's taking my body heat and that's telling her body, okay, it's warm out. It's time to use some energy. It's time to wiggle. <laughs> but that's why she's gotten so squirmy. <laughs> All right. All well, right. If that's the case, I'm going to go pop her back into her enclosure and then get ready for our last guest today. Thank you, Autumn. She's like, but I'm so warm now. <laughs> She's swirling around a bit in her cage. All right. And so our third guest today is an old pal of mine. <laughs> um, I have been here as long as she has. She basically came to Rockfish right when I did. So one of my jobs when I first started here was to socialize her, which meant holding her and talking to her and spending a lot of time with her. So pretty much the best job ever because she's a Virginia opossum. Um, and I am going to put on these gloves. So whenever I handle, her name is Scarlet Pearl. <laughs> Whenever I handle her, um, I always make sure to wear these because opossums have the most teeth of any mammal in North America, including humans. They have 50 little razor sharp teeth and they also don't have wonderful vision. So if Scarlet Pearl smells banana from meal prep earlier in the day on my hands, she might just take a little um, exploratory nibble. So I always like to make sure I've got my gloves on and I'm going to pop this right down on the table because I've set up a little snuffle mat for Scarlet Pearl so she can be foraging for food while I talk about her. <laughs> All right, let me go grab her. Hello, ma'am. She's fast asleep. <laughs> oh, I love this. <laughs> So here's Scarlet Pearl. <laughs> As I said, she is a Virginia opossum. She's just getting her bearings right now and she's gonna start to snuffle for food. <laughs> These mats are really wonderful for um, mental stimulation. So it's really important that all of our captive animals and our rehabilitation patients receive a lot of mental stimulation that helps basically cue up those instincts that they're born with to forage and to explore their environment with their food and with their mouth if you're a possum. So I've just hidden some kibble in this snuffle mat and she, loves going after it while we do Zoom outreach programming. Um, but Scarlet Pearl is a love of mine. <laughs> I have absolutely fallen in love with Virginia opossums. And it is important to note that Virginia opossums, that's the name for all the possums in North America. So we are just lucky that it is called the Virginia opossum. But any opossum that you see in North America, the species is the Virginia opossum. And they are our only marsupial in the United States, in North America, actually, including Canada. Once you go to Mexico and below, I believe there's, um, I believe there's eight species in Mexico of possums and then many more in South America. But we are special in that we have the opossum. So there are no just possums in North America. It is all the Virginia opossum. It's just easy to get a bit lazy. I know I do and drop the O off of that. But whenever you're writing it, it's always going to be opossum. Um, but as I said, there are only marsupial. So <laughs> She's chewing with her mouth open. <laughs> um, so that means that they are a pouched mammal. In Latin, it literally translates to two wombs. So she has an internal uterus, and then she basically has two um, portholes out <laughs> into her pouch, and that's the second womb for an opossum. And the pouch, it's not like this sealed shut thing. It's a big fuzzy pocket on her tummy. I would show you, but she gets a little shy, <laughs> so I will, not, um, I will not indignify her by doing that today. But just imagine it's a big fuzzy pocket right on her belly. And when those babies are born, they travel from the internal uterus where they were fertilized, and they are about the size of a bumblebee. So 20 of them can fit into one teaspoon. They are absolutely teeny tiny, tiny little beans, um, and they will travel out from the inside of her uterus to her pouch. And in the pouch, there are 13 nipples and it is already natural selection. So if she gives birth to 20 babies, 
only 13 of them are going to locate a nipple within her pouch and latch on. So the other remaining, unfortunately, will not make it. But yeah, natural selection. It's survival of the fittest right from birth out in the wild. And so um, once they latch on to a nipple or a teat, it swells within their mouth and essentially goes all the way down into their throat. Um, so they are totally attached to their mother within that pouch. It's not like there's babies just falling out of the pouch all the time. They are latched into mom. And that's why it's really important if you encounter a baby opossum to get that baby possum into care. Because when we are re rehabilitating baby possums, we have to intubate them to feed them. They don't know how to suckle like other mammals do or like humans do. We have to feed the tube all the way down their throat into their stomach, which as you can imagine, takes some pretty specialized training. <laughs> um, so that's why it's really important to get them into a wildlife rehabilitator's care who knows how to feed them using that tube method. So once they're in the pouch and they each have a nipple, they get that amazing 24 seven drip of milk from their mom. Um, they will be in there for maybe one to two months until they grow fur of their own. Once they have their own fur and they're getting um, kind of tweeny, <laughs> they will leave the mom's pouch and they will crawl onto her back. So if you are ever lucky, you will see the opossum mom school bus as I like to call it. So a mom walking around with with up to 12 or so babies just clinging to her fur. However, cover your ears, opossums are not the best moms. Um, so if one of those babies falls off, she's not going back for that baby. <laughs> it's another reason, example of why animals in the wild, especially smaller prey animals, have so many babies at once. It's because they anticipate predation or some of them just not making it. So if you do find a baby uh, possum clinging to the back porch <laughs> one morning, definitely give us a ring because it, mom is not going to come back. Reuniting is not really a scenario that we encounter with mammals um, or with opossums, excuse me. Normally with mammals, we'll recommend that if you find a baby one, that you leave it out for a few hours and make sure that there's no mother in the area coming down to feed it or grab it and take it back to the nest or den. With an opossum, that baby's on its own and should come into us. So feel free to just give us a call. Um, but yeah, they have very interesting reproduction. Um, but they have so many babies because they really don't live for a long time. <laughs> so an opossum's lifespan in the wild is just one year which is very short and very surprising, um, particularly because a lot of the mammals that we like to think about are these big charismatic megafauna, like polar bears or elephants that live for much longer than that and will have only one or two babies at a time. In ecology though, we divide mammals and most animals into kind of two different camps. So some animals are like that where they're long lived and they have just one or two babies at a time and they don't have many offspring overall. So humans are in that camp. We live for 70 years. We maybe have up to four plus children. Um, that's on the, the larger end these days. With many other smaller animals that make good prey, like an opossum, they live for a very short amount of time and they have a ton of babies all at once. And once they've done that, they've survived, they've reproduced. And their job is done as a species because that's what we're all here to do as animals. We're here to survive and reproduce. So for opossums, it just looks a little bit different. So within that one year of life, they will be born, they will sexually mature, they will mate, they will have 13 new babies. <laughs> and then often, they are too old um, to take care of themselves in the wild. They slow down a lot and they're eaten by something or otherwise pass on. Scarlet Pearl is two and a half. <laughs> so she is quite ancient for an opossum. However, we have amazing veterinarians at the Wildlife Center of Virginia that treat all of our education ambassador patients. So she's currently on glucosamine. She's on a joint supplement and she gets a special arthritis medication three times a week and she is doing Doing really well. Um, she's on a very strict diet and has exercise hour three times a week <laughs> with us. So she is doing absolutely fabulously. In captivity with this kind of care, a lifespan can be up to around four years. So as you can imagine, we're quite attached to Miss Scarlet Pearl. <laughs> Um, and we expect her to live for a lot longer with us. 
she is with us because she has a neurological condition. So this is not normal for an opossum, this head shaking, constant sneezing. She has a very hard time walking around quickly and navigating. And in fact, I have never seen her climb and climbing is absolutely essential for an opossum to survive. It's their main adaptation and it's their instinct if they think that they are being preyed upon. They just go up whatever's nearest. Oh, she's sliding off the table. <laughs> they go up the nearest tall thing, normally a tree, and that's how they hide. Scarlet Pearl came in with a bunch of her siblings and we went to go release them. And then we noticed that she was ataxic. So she was basically kind of on her side, walking in circles, um, not really moving super well. And our vets at the Wildlife Center determined she had some kind of neurological condition. Uh, we don't have a name for it. As you can imagine, there's not a lot of um, money being poured into the fields of opossum neurology these days. One day, one day. Um, but because of that, she was not a fit candidate for release and she lives with us. So I mentioned she came in with her siblings and that's important to note. So those possums in a mom's pouch are very well protected. It is a really nice little warm safe haven from the world. But opossums are often unfortunately hit by cars. They are nocturnal, they are low to the ground, they're pretty slow, no offense. So it can often be really difficult to see them until it's too late. However, there is hope. If you do hit a possum, especially between February and September, if it's safe to do so, so you know, don't hop out on the side of I-64, but um, if you're on a nice country back road, hop out and use something like a stick or even your hand covered in a towel to gently turn mom over and look on her belly. Right where your belly button is, is right where the pouch is on an opossum. And it is very easy to see if there are babies inside. Like I mentioned, it's not sealed shut you won't have to pry anything open. You just see a lot of squirming and hands and faces right in there. If there are babies in there, they can survive for another 24 hours or so after their mom has passed. So you can take them right out, keep them nice and warm in the car. Sometimes that's keeping them on your lap and bring them right into us or your nearest wildlife center. Um, actually twice this past summer, I went to go get groceries at the food line in Lovingston. And on one morning I noticed, oh, there's an opossum there that I didn't see there the day before. I'm just gonna stop and check. Lo and behold, there were nine babies in that opossum's pouch. And then I think there were 11 babies the second time it happened. And in both of those cases, I was able to take those babies, bring them right back to Rockfish. And my coworker, Julia, was able to feed them right away and get them nice and warm. And those babies have since been released. So always good to keep in mind that opossums are quite robust little creatures. They have a great will to survive. And there is still hope for even um, the most unfortunate of opossum moms. Um, I mentioned that they're great climbers, so I do want to share a few of their awesome adaptations that they have to be able to do so. So one is this, I'm going to just turn the mat around, I know, she's like, where's the kibble? It's all gone. <laughs> she's on a diet though, so I shouldn't give her more. <laughs> Um, they have a prehensile tail. So most mammals with tails, it's just an extension of their spine and it helps with balance. Um, but an opossum can wrap their tail around things. Ooh, hit my keyboard. <laughs> and um, that allows them to better navigate up in aerial environments through trees. And it's also notably furless. So it's kind of scaly. A lot of people say, oh, it looks like a rat's tail. Well, it sort of is. And that's because if they use their tail to grip, that would be like if we had furry palms. If you try and pick up a mug with a furry palm, it's just gonna slide right out of your hand. So having a surface with more friction with those scales allows her to actually be able to grip with the tail that she has that can wrap around things. They also have very dexterous little thumbs. You might or hands, you can see she's kind of holding them up. It looks like a little human finger with fingerless gloves on, but on her back feet, she's just way more interested in the kibble, <laughs> understandably. She has an opposable thumb. She sometimes is a little shy about showing it off. I know, oh goodness. <laughs> 
Um, but she has an opposable thumb that looks just like ours. I don't think she's going to show it off for us today, unfortunately. But they use that opposable thumb to hang out in the trees and really climb and grip their environment. So that thumb is what allows them to hold around things as opposed to other mammals that don't have that and just have to hang. So it really helps them excel up in the trees. And I do want to say before taking some questions around her that opossums make incredible neighbors. And that is, all right, I'm gonna give you some more. <laughs> um, they make amazing neighbors because of something that they eat. So opossums are pretty much our best defense in the wild against ticks. One opossum can eat 5,000 ticks or more per summer. So that's just one opossum in your yard can eat up to 5,000 or more ticks. Um, so that's incredible. <laughs> and it's wonderful to have a population of opossums in their neighborhood because they are able to keep us more safe from tick-borne diseases as well as keeping our pets and our kids safe too. Um, so they do that because they split their day between eating, as she's doing, <laughs> sleeping, and grooming themselves. So she uses those fingerless glove hands to groom her lustrous coat all day long. And when she encounters a tick on her, which is quite often because she's a nice warm host for that tick, instead of plucking it off with tweezers and, you know, throwing it down the toilet like humans do, she pops it into her mouth and has a snack. <laughs> so they are able to really wonderfully control our pest population here in Virginia. They also are a great predator for a lot of non-native mice and rats. So it's just another reason why they're so great in the neighborhood. Um, so I'd love to take some questions with the time that I have left, whether that's about Scarlet Pearl or our rehabilitation facility or any of the animals that we have, really any questions that you might have, I'd, I'd love to hear. <laughs> and Scarlet Pearl will stay out with us <laughs> while we chat. I have one. Um, what what was wrong with, I think it was the barn owls that you released that looked so much better with the after pictures? Yes, <laughs> they did look they, so much better. How did they get like that? I mean, they didn't even look like the same animal. Yes. Bird, you know. So those animals came into us because they fell down someone's fireplace. So uh, she woke up one morning to a clutch of baby barn owls sitting in her living room <laughs> because they had toppled down the fireplace. And it wasn't really possible to put them back up there. We didn't know where the parents were or what kind of situation that was. So um, in that case, we determined that it would be best for them to come into care because clearly something went wrong for them to end up down there. So they came in and a lot of baby raptors are born looking pretty ugly <laughs> because yeah. they're born with the beak and the talons, um, but they're mostly just born with that soft feathery down. They don't need the big waterproofing or flight feathers that come as they develop um, because they're not flying anymore where they are staying in their nest or in their tree um, being taken care of by their parents. So as they grow up and mature, those um, more mature feathers will come in and then they can start to fly. But it is a pretty dramatic <laughs> transformation. Yeah, I've never seen a baby. I thought it was like illness or something. Yeah, it, no, that's just that a normal duration. looking barn owlet. Okay. <laughs> and um, a baby owl is called an owlet, which I think is the cutest thing that I've ever yeah. heard. But just passing that on. <laughs> um, yeah, they are pretty strikingly ugly, cute ugly though. The, the caller, the rescuer actually thought that they were vultures at first because of how distinctly hooked their, their faces were. But no, they're just little barn owls. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. I see someone else's unmuted. Did you want? Uh, um, I have a question. Well, first of all, thank you, Sarah. This was really interesting. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question about squirrels. Last year, I had a squirrel on my patio, and it it was injured. It looked so. It was so sad, and so I called your organization, and I couldn't um, bring it over unless. Mm -hmm put it in a cage or something. But anyway, it, in the course of the conversation, the person said to me, you shouldn't be feeding them because I'll feed them peanuts. And I was telling a friend of mine that, and she said, well, it's winter and we feed birds. People go to the store and buy bird seeds. So why is it okay to feed birds, but not to buy food and feed um, squirrels? Because they're out there too, looking for food. 
Yeah, of course. That's a really great and complicated question because there's so many different kind of camps around this. So some people will say, well, let's not feed the birds at all either, because then if we're going to abide by this rule of not feeding wildlife, then birds definitely fall under that umbrella. However, mm -hmm. there are plenty of people that do love feeding birds. Um, it's really great for people to get to know their environment a little bit better and become um, advocates for birds. We need more advocates for birds. So I totally understand why people will continue to feed birds. And it's tough to um, feed birds in a way that excludes squirrels, especially when they eat so much of the same stuff. So that's going to naturally happen if you do have a bird feeder. Um, I think what is best in that situation is to not purposefully put food out specifically for the squirrel. So if you do have a bird feeder, try and have a feeder that is they call it squirrel proof. Seed will still fall down and the squirrels will come and forage from that. Um, but that's a good option to deter squirrels or other animals because if there are squirrels coming during the day, there are a lot more animals coming at night and starting to rely on that food source. And it's that reliance that we want mm -hmm. to prevent because we don't want animals, A, to expect food from humans. And we yeah. don't want animals to get comfortable with humans because that's not only not healthy for the animal and their diet, but also can be dangerous for humans if we suddenly have a bunch of squirrels that are approaching humans <laughs> in public spaces. So I would recommend against maybe putting peanuts out for squirrels specifically, but if you are feeding birds from bird feeder, that's going to naturally happen. It's just going that extra step of putting food out, you know, cat food out for opossums or peanuts out on the porch for squirrels, where I'd recommend against that just for their safety and for yours. But yeah, it's a, it's a big old umbrella of a question a lot of different opinions in that area. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Are you an employee of the of the rockfish sanctuary, but not the owner? No, so our um, founder and executive director is named Natu Attinger, and she um, she actually founded our sanctuary out of her home <laughs> way uh -huh. back in 2004. And as you can imagine, you can only handle so many raccoons on your property at once needing right. care yeah. for um, building and starting a, a designated facility for it. So I am an employee here. I am currently our outreach coordinator. So I am a wildlife rehabilitator in our busy summertime. And during the winter, I get to focus more on outreach programming and talking to folks like you about why it's so important to have rehabbers and to support our, our wildlife. So right. I can staff. Um, we do have a variety of volunteers. So we have volunteers that come in and help care for the animals. We're always looking for more volunteers. But um, there are also ways to volunteer time or money as well. So we have a active working board um, that we're always looking for new interest in if you're interested in joining our board. Um, and we run a variety of fundraisers throughout the year that you can share with friends. Um, we're also always looking for extra donations of supplies or if you have old towels or blankets in your house, we go oh, yeah. so many <laughs> during the year. So right. a couple of old towels goes a long way for an orphaned raccoon. <laughs> Oh, good, good, yeah, because I've got a lot of stuff like that. And good. that would be like uh, maybe fabric recycling, mm -hmm. you know, where you have stuff that you want to get rid of. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there are things that you wouldn't want to take, but that, that's a good idea. Yeah, we have a list on our website of supplies, like typically mm -hmm. stuff you can get from the grocery store, stuff you have lying around that we're in, in search of. So definitely check that out for a more extensive list. Yeah, good. Well, you're a natural. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's all because of my co-workers <laughs> <laughs> they make you look good right <laughs> oh, thank you. I know we're a few minutes over and there's some folks putting thank yous in the chat, but I also see it. James W. Patterson one yes. you're unmuted. Did you want to say I something? I'm Julie Patterson. And okay. I have a quick question for Sarah. Mm -hmm. When you mentioned you had been to Food Lion and bought some food for the feeding mm -hmm. and you noticed a uh, baby opossum and then found um, nine or 11 or whatever you mentioned, had the mother been killed and you were able to save the babies? 
Yes, so I, I should have been more clear, my apologies. Um, the mother had clearly been hit by a car. So I just saw an adult possum lying in the road. It was dead, so I couldn't help it at that point. Um, but I did just decide, oh, I'm gonna hop out. Maybe it's a mom, um, you know, maybe it's a female with babies right now. And lo and behold, it was. So if you see an opossum that is, of course, like intact, obviously, if something is very much road killed, it's beyond helping. But if you see someone that maybe just got hit in the head and passed away, there's definitely hope for the babies that could still be living inside of that pouch. Mm -hmm. The very most important thing. Oh, excuse me. Very interesting. And thank oh, you so much. A wonderful. You're so welcome. Yeah, the most important thing with any baby animal, whether that's a baby mammal or a baby bird, is going to be warmth. Don't worry about feeding it or watering it. That's what the rehabbers are for because we know exactly how to safely do that. So you just want to make sure that that baby is warm to the touch. Sort of like if you were to touch another human's forehead, it should be that warm, nice and toasty and clearly giving off some heat. Um, so very important to keep in mind that is going to be the most essential thing for maintain or for giving that animal a second chance. Thank yeah. you. Any other questions? Let's see anybody else unmuting. Um, what a what a, a delightful, adorable, <laughs> informative presentation. I mean that it was just so fun. So. Oh, it's really thank you too. <laughs> wow I definitely as someone shared you know you've you found your your passion at least oh, one of them and we thank you for sharing it with us that was very lovely I learned a ton too <laughs> yeah and um, thank you for your tip about donating towels and things like that that's uh definitely a good thing i mean and um definitely feel free to check out our art auction i think it's going till sunday so there's some pretty good stuff i got my eye on right now <laughs> so go and please outbid me <laughs> <laughs> thank you um, thank you so thank much, you so much. Um, yeah and thank you all for coming <laughs> all right thank i you. will log on out and put my scarlet pearl Back in her enclosure for the bye year. scarlet pearl i i think i've i wouldn't say i've fallen in love with possums but i'm i'm a step closer now yeah i feel you <laughs> one day you'll be a crazy possum lady like me it's, it's gonna happen okay <laughs> thanks so much thank Sarah. you so much have a great evening everyone you too bye bye, <laughs> bye, -bye pearl <laughs>